Now, my purpose in being here this time is not the same as it used to be. And after all, how dull it would be if after 20 or 30 years, or whenever it was you in the last, if I were to up and say the same things. God expands our projects. He expands our purposes. So I'm going to begin with an expanded one, which I expect to go forth in this world and accomplish great things. But then some of you who are all new, don't be discouraged. Before I get done, see, I'm going backwards, beginning at the back end. And before I get done, I am going to get down to the smallest and the simplest. Now, I'll tell how the expanded thing came to me. It was when I was still living in Westboro, and there came a time when I, for no reason that I knew, I suddenly felt depressed. I felt a burden on me. Now, when I feel depressed, you see, I came out of 20 years of depression, so... When I feel depressed, my first impulse is to think, oh dear, what's the matter with me? You know, am I sliding downhill again? And actually, I think that's a very sensible thing for any of you. If you feel come upon you an unexplained feeling of depression, I think it is sensible for you to first say, Lord, what's the matter with me? Maybe there's something he wants you to do you've forgotten to do. Maybe there's somebody you're mad with and you think it's more fun to be mad with them than to forgive them. <laughs> ask him. He'll tell you. And if he tells you, do it. Well, I asked him, but at that moment, I got no answer. So if I try that and get no answer, then the next thing I say is, I say, well, Lord, is there somebody you want me to pray for? And I listened. You know, I used to think you couldn't hear God. I guess I thought God had lost his voice. <laughs> he hadn't lost his voice. <laughs> Before we get done with this CFO, I hope maybe I can pass on to all of you how to hear him. There, there, there is, I mean, you can sort of learn how. I know. Because I've learned how in the last 10 years, I guess it is. Maybe about 15 years. So, however, I was just sort of beginning to learn how then, and I said, is there somebody special you want me to pray for? And I listened. And, of course, you know, when I listen like that, you mothers will know, I always kind of quickly hold up this one of my children and that one and the other one. But, no, nothing came to me. And so then I said, well, Lord, what is it? Because I knew there was something, because the burden wouldn't go away. And there was no physical reason to account for the burden, you know. So, when I said, Lord, what is it? It came to me that it was a calamity. This was a precognition. It was a bit of a gift of prophecy, you might say. It was a knowledge beforehand of a calamity that was going to come, not to any one person, but to the northwestern part of the United States, especially around the region of Olympia. Now, at that time, my oldest son lived, had a school there in Tacoma. So, of course, I said again, Lord, is it dead? Is it my son? No. It was not an individual, but it was something that was going to happen. So then I said, Lord, may I pray for it to be averted? That is, for it not to happen. And the answer came, no. Now, I did hear it in words, no. You feel it inside, no. You just, you just feel it. You just can't. You just know you can't. It's too big. If you haven't learned to hear God's no, you better learn it because you can save yourself a lot of trouble. <laughs> Because some things are too big. So then I said, Lord, may I pray for it to be minimized? That is, okay, if it's got to happen, let it happen, but be not as bad as it might have been. And the answer said, yes. And now I didn't hear it in words. I heard it this way. And as soon as I said that, I felt good. I felt all happy inside. 
You see? So for two or three days, I ran around praying for the state of Washington, the western part of the state of Washington. Now, I've never done such a fool thing in my life before. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> but you know, after three days, there came an earthquake there. My son was, uh, it happened at breakfast time, and he was on a breakfast old group or party of some group, and he was talking on the, on the thing, you know, on the air. <laughs> he went on joking, he didn't know he was off the air. <laughs> Everybody else ran out except one lady who got under the table. Somebody said to him afterwards, why didn't you get under the table? He said, with that lady. <laughs> Anyway, I tell these funny little instances just to show you the thing was real. And I had witnesses that were there with my own son and so on. But now, here's the, here's the nice thing. It did no harm. It stopped just short of being a really destructive earthquake. Now, I've seen the one in Alaska, what it did, and where a whole section of land dropped down about 20 feet. I was there last May, I guess it was flying around on a plane with Bishop Thorne and looking at this mess and talking to the Indians. But uh, nobody can prove whether prayer helped this or not. If you're sick and pray for healing, it's very hard to prove, you know, how much the doctor helped and how much your prayer helped. But some things you know inside of you. And I know that prayer helped. And I know that I was instructed to pray for that particular thing. Now, I was living in New England, you see, and my husband had gone to his reward two or three years before. You know, here's something, but I'll tell you, it may not seem strange to some of you people, though it may to others. I had known when he was to go because he had had a succession of heart attacks and poor health, and I had asked, Oh, Lord, how long do you want him to stay here? And he told me, So I knew. I had uh, no reason why I should know, and yet, in a way, there's no harm in knowing. It's a very... <laughs> better... No, I won't tell you either. I'm going to tell you something else. So I said, i not tell you all my secrets. <laughs> but it's a great comfort... I still pray for his wholeness, but I pray for his wholeness both on this side and on the other side in whatever way God knew was best. So anyway, so I lived on in the same place for about three or four years after he passed away. Then I said, Lord, do you want me to move? And I had a feeling he did. My children did anyway. They were all on the West Coast. So they say, Mom, what are we supposed to do if you get sick? Fly 3,000 miles to see about you. Why don't you come about here? So I considered whether to move up Washington, where Ted was, or whether to move to Southern California, where Jack was, and also my daughter, Chuki. And I chose to move to Southern California, mainly because Jean Dixon and other people kept on prophesying. She prophesied first that in 1966, the whole of Southern California was going to be totally destroyed by earthquakes and cast into the ocean. It was in the newspapers. So I moved up there in 1965, I think it was, or 1964. Um, and really and truly, I'm not joking, my feeling was there is danger in that place. I have a geological friend, a scientist, who knows all about it. Southern California is going to have earthquakes for quite some centuries yet. It's that kind of country. It's new country. I do not pray for there to be no earthquakes. That would not be possible. Uh, I won't take time to explain why, but I do understand. It's a matter of geology. It's the way the land's growing, you see. But I knew that I could pray. The Lord had showed me, you see, that I could pray for it to be minimized. But I could pray for it not to be destructive as it was prophesied. And I also thought it would be easier to pray if I were right there, you see. And it is easier because being there I can feel the pulse of the earth. 
You know, this is one of the things that's happened to me since you knew me last. I hope I've gotten nearer to God and to heaven. Certainly I have great fun thinking, ooh, sometime maybe I'll tell you my ideas about a little bit about where the various sins may be and what they may be like. I don't know, but it's great fun imagining. But also, I become more earthy. I really mean it. Living there, I can feel the pulse of the earth. I know when it's tensing up. I bought a house right on the San Andreas Fault. My biggest patient is the San Andreas Fault. <laughs> I have more fun praying for the healing of the San Andreas folks. <laughs> now, how do I dare to pray for such a great thing? Now, I don't pray for it in South America. Maybe some of you here will start it, because someone should. I feel like I carry this from Alaska to Mexico, and that's about it for. <laughs> I'm being funny, but I'm not perfectly being funny. I can't help it if I'm this way, because I really mean it. <laughs> some of you may get the commission to take on, or some of you may know somebody who lives in Mexico or South America. Maybe Francis McNair should think of somebody for me. He is a, a monk whom I know down there. At any rate, so far, it's only Alaska to Mexico. And I pray I can tell when the San Andreas fault is sort of tensing up a little bit. Now there's no way of proving this. There's no way of proving When I just tell it all by myself and nobody says anything, you see, I just simply look at the mountains up there as I can from my house. And I have great joy in praying for them. And I pray for them with a perfectly clear conscience. I feel that I'm being theologically sound. I was brought up in the Southern Presbyterian Church, and believe you me, you had to be theologically sound. Well, in those days, I don't think they understood about the San Andreas Fall. <laughs> but how can I dare pray for it? I can dare pray for it because Jesus Christ, my Lord, cared enough about this little earth to come and die upon it. And the blood of the Lamb was shed upon this earth. Long ago in the old days that Marshall will remember, I heard Star Daily say that the blood of the Lamb shed upon this earth still remains no longer as a red fluid, not as plasma or dust or any visible substance, but ever increasing in a chain reaction by the spiritual power that is in it and filling the very air that surrounds the earth. You have you seen it? Yes, you have. And I believe that. And I go a little bit further than that. And the second step I got from Pierre Taillard de Chardin. The most extraordinary is the Roman a Jesuit priest and also a prehistorian. He stated that the blood of Jesus being shed upon this earth and ever increasing by his redeeming power even seeps into the earth itself. So that he said if people didn't open their mouths to praise him, the very stones should praise him. So I call on the blood of the Lamb. Invisible but powerful. And I say, O oh Lord Jesus, let your redeeming energy shed upon this earth now sink into this tense area and quiet it down. Quiet it down. Quiet it down. Let there be little tremors as many as they like. That's fun. I love to feel them. But they're not very many, really. But nothing destructive. Now, of course, at times when I just feel it myself and nobody tells me, I have no way of telling whether it works or not, but all I know is that if you pray for the blood of the Lamb to fill the earth, you can't do any harm anyhow. <laughs> but there's many a time, you see, when it's not just that I know it myself, but predictions come out in the newspapers sometimes from somebody like Jean Dixon or somebody. I'm very grateful for those predictions because they alert me when to pray, you see. The thing doesn't happen as predicted, <laughs> but the predictions alert 
Those of us who know how to pray, when to pray. And some of them are by Caltech and the scientific, uh, you know, that the great outfit there in Yala saying this that worked out all these things scientifically. So they come out with at such a time, you know, <laughs> They're going to be earthquakes in this place or that place. Now that's a true prophecy, whether it is scientific, and it may also be a perfectly true prophecy when it comes through a person who has an undoubted gift of prophecy, like Jane Dixon. I'm not laughing at that, no making fun of it. It can be a true prophecy. But look, God is greater than fate. And even if, according to faith, such a thing is going to be, if you call God into it, it doesn't have to be. After every prophecy, there's a big question mark. Remember, dear old John, I went to Nineveh, some a peculiar method of transportation, as I seem to recall. Uh, but I guess I haven't been making it in quite a while to catch up with poor old John, but when I find him, I'm sure going to ask him about his accommodation. <laughs> in that whale and <laughs> so on but never mind anyway he went he got there and he went up and down the land and he prophesied as he was directed which was yet forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed but forty days passed and Nineveh was not destroyed why? was John wrong? no he wasn't wrong the people understood that unless they repented and turned unto the Lord Nineveh would be destroyed God is always stronger than faith. Remember the 14th verse of the 7th chapter of 2nd Chronicles. I think that's right. If my people who are called by my name, now look, that's us. There could be millions of people all over this country that wouldn't dream, they wouldn't be interested in this, they wouldn't do a thing. Doesn't matter, we've got enough right here. Here are his people called by his name, Christians. It doesn't say if everybody in the nation does this. It says, if my people who are called by my name will repent of their evil deeds and turn unto me, then I will hear them from my holy place, and I will come to them, and I will save their land. Now, I'm interested in a whole lot more than the San Andreas Fault. You know, you hear a great many people say nowadays that these are the latter days. I, I think there's truth there. I think very likely they are. Though not necessarily. Well, not, and my own feeling is, not of the entire cosmos, but of this age. Possibly of this solar system, though I imagine just this age. But at any rate, I do know that we are nearing a great change. And yet, to tell the truth, I deplore the attitude of most people about it. The Jesus people run around talking about this. But their feeling is, oh, well, it doesn't matter, you know. I'll be raptured, and so what do I care? <laughs> not too fond of that word. It's not even grammatical. But anyway, to get back to uh, what I'm talking about... It's a sort of a goofing off attitude, you know. And with a lot of us, it's a sort of a goofing off attitude. Oh, well, so what, you know. Jesus is coming pretty soon, and, and we'll either, you know, one will be taken, one will be taken, and one will be left, and so forth. I bet I'll be one of the ones left. Be just like him to lead me to help clean up. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I do believe that the latter days are coming. But I believe that we have a great and very exciting duty and responsibility about this. Now, Jesus told many parables illustrating this. You remember the man that owned a vineyard? And he left it in charge of his steward and his servants. And he said, now take good care of it, you see. But he didn't tell them when he was coming back. 
And after a while, they said, well, my master delays his coming. And they began, began to be lazy and rather vicious and beat up the slaves and were cruel to people and were dishonest and so forth. When he came, when he came according to that story, <laughs> did he promote his stewards and his servants? He did not. They were the ones he was made with. Now, this is just the story, the way Jesus told it. He was very wroth for those servants. Out, you. He cast them out of his vineyard. They were fired. They were finished. So I don't think this is any time to goof off. Sure, there's a different age coming. Well, that's exciting. You don't want things to be the same all the time, do you? Sure, there's a different age coming. Well, what are we supposed to do about it? Now, I think Jesus told us what to do about it. And we do it. We say it every Sunday of our lives, but I don't think we take it quite seriously. He said that we were to pray, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now, I don't know whether you believe me, but I want to tell you that you have more power through Jesus, and Jesus has more power through you than you dream of. But now a question is so apt to come in our minds, and that is, well, all right, God is the one who heals. God is the one who saves. Why doesn't he do it all himself? Well, when you get to heaven, you ask him that. But all I know is, at the present time, he doesn't. And we are told this in Genesis 3, and the same theme carries on to Revelation 22. Whole way through. He made man, he made human beings, he put them on this earth, he said, okay, you carry on, have dominion. They didn't do too well at it, and he himself came in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and we'll have special talks about him later on, in order to increase our power and increase our faith in order to himself be here forever with us to help us, but still even he does not take it out of our hands and just carry it on. That's not the way the ball game is played, if I may be real silly for a moment. <laughs> I went to a big, big ball game the other It's a great temptation for me not to pray for my favorite team, but I try not to. <laughs> but anyway, there's a certain way the ball game is played. The umpire doesn't just get up there and throw all the balls himself. That's not the ball game. That's not the way it's played. <laughs> this probably seems very silly. Maybe not to some of you younger ones. But really, that's not the way the game is played on her. We are chosen to be the agents of God, the active agents of God. We are chose to, chosen to be the present channels through whom Jesus works. And what does it take to do that? What it takes is what we're going to talk about, and I'm going to begin at the bigger things and get on to smaller things. But I began at the bigger things because I don't want you to get mired down in the smaller things. Stretch your minds to begin with somehow. And what it takes is faith. Now, some years ago, I forget just how many, there began to be wars and disturbances in the Near East. The very beginning of this, you remember, with the Jews and the Arabs and the Syrians and whatnot. And when it first spread out, it seemed to be a very, very dangerous thing for the whole world. And you read in the newspapers how this might start another world war, you see. Well, I happened to be in Paris that time doing a few lectures, the only time I ever had <laughs> very poor lectures, too, because I don't speak French. Uh, well, anyhow. <laughs> but, but anyway, I was trying my best. And I was there, and uh, my friend Ernestine was there with me. Some of you may remember old Ernestine, the old days. She was with me then. Still living, but doesn't get around much. Um, 
So Ernestine and I were with a French lady uh, in the middle of Paris. Ernestine's French was beautiful, just beautiful. And so this French lady was telling us about the dreadful things, the horrible things that had happened in Paris. This was where these people were massacred, and this was where so many other people were killed and put to death and so on and so on. And now she said, it's all starting over again. It's all starting over again. We're going to have, the whole world, we're going to have to go through it all again. She said this in French, you know. And I said, no, we are not. Because we have authority through Jesus. And Jesus has authority through us. And Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, they may ask what they will, and it shall be done unto them. So here are three of us. And we happen to be right in front of the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Let us go in there now and pray that this war will end very, very speedily. Perhaps within a week, it ended in six days. You remember the six-day war? Okay. Can't prove prayer had anything to do with it. You can't prove prayer didn't have anything to do with it. My own feeling is that more of us dared to pray that kind of a prayer, I think. Now, of course, it was only that present crisis that ended. I still pray for the peace of Jerusalem because that's the command of the Bible. You'll find it in the Psalms. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. I prayed for the peace of Jerusalem in a, in a talk like this. Just one lecture. You brought each one time. And the next morning, the papers came out with the first ceasefire. It's awfully hard to break because who knows what's right really with all the, you know, the Syrians and the Egyptians and everything. But after all, they've been at it now for 2,000 years and more, have they, the Israelites and the Egyptians? It's about time they came to some kind of a settlement. So, at any rate, there is still and always need for prayer, but the power of prayer, you see, is something that we have not even begun to realize. Now, I have a special project, a very special project, for this um, CFO. And I may get time to suggest it to you tonight, or I may wait till next time. But then I promise in my next talk I will come down to other things. And yet, now I want to tell you one more story of this power of faith and how it can work in these somewhat unusual ways. Now, this is a smaller thing, yet it could have been quite serious. This concerns a high school. It happened to be in Tennessee. And there was a very violent group in the high school. I don't know what color they were. I don't know whether this had to do with color or not. But I do know that there was one group there that was very violent. And they said that Friday was going to be Bloody Friday. And they were going to come to school with knives and switchblades. And they were really going to mess this up. Now, the teachers did not know this. Only some of the pupils knew. And one young girl there, 14 years old, and she'd never been to a CFO, but she was the daughter of an school rector. She learned something about Jesus that way. <laughs> Her father happened to be rather a high church rector. So what she did, some of you may think a little odd. She went to her father and she got a large bottle of holy water. Now that is water that has been blessed, like the water in baptism. You know, sanctify this water to the mystical washing away of sin. It's no problem to be, me to believe that a spiritual power can enter into the water. But if you can't or would rather not believe it, never mind. You can think of it as just a symbol if you prefer but what they did was, this girl and a friend of hers, also 14 years old, they each got a bottle of holy water from the priest. They went to the school on a Saturday night when there was no one there, not a soul. No one ever knew this except the rector. He told me, but I'm 3,000 miles away, and you people don't know who is, who he is. And so these two girls marched around the whole school, you know, like Joshua were in the city of Jericho. But they were marching not to destroy it, but to save it. To save it. 
And as they marched around the school, they smashed the holy water on the school. Maybe it was a symbol. Maybe it was like the children of, of Israel putting the blood of the lamb on the lintels of the doorpost, you know. But they were praying in their minds. I don't know, the don't think they said anything out loud. But in their minds, they were praying for the peace of the school. Friday came. Nothing happened. No one said anything about it. Saturday came. Nothing happened. No one ever said anything about it. Nothing ever happened. The whole thing just vanished away. As if it had never been. This was an ordinary public school. Do you see the tremendous power? Now, what I'm talking about is the secret power. I mean, a power that's so fantastic that you're smarter not to talk about it. You talk about it, people will laugh at you. You know. Tremendous, unbelievable power of the Lord that is in our hands to use for Him, to use in His service to bring His kingdom of heaven on earth. Now you want me to tell you one more story? You want me to stop now? I forget how long I'm supposed to talk. <laughs> so, okay, this one may take just a little bit longer. Uh, one time, I wonder if you remember a, uh, a certain spring about two years ago, was it maybe? Um, two or three years ago, when all through the spring the newspapers came out saying next summer is going to be a long, hot summer. Remember that? The summer before there had been riots and there had been burnings and disturbances in many large cities. And so all, they, all spring the newspapers came out with these prophecies, you see. I do think some prophecies we could do without, but anyway, never mind. That's, they got to make a living somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so in May that summer, I had a sort of a school of pastoral care, a different kind of one, because this one was for women. Women only, and as my helper, I chose my friend Olivia Henry. She happens to be, uh, well, you like to call it black, but she isn't black. She's light brown. She says, I'm just God's little brown cookie. <laughs> But she is a Negro woman minister and one of the saints of the Lord. Oh, she is one of the saints of the Lord. I've got her coming out to Pasadena to help me in a series of lectures in the biggest church in Pasadena. You don't like it, it's just going to be too bad. <laughs> we'll see. Not because she's Negro, don't worry about it. I don't care what color she is. But the point is, that woman has power. She has power. And I know it because for many, many years, she and her little prayer group, by constant prayer for a certain large city, one of the largest cities of the north, held it completely quiet. Never a riot, never a trouble. Every single day a group of them that were filled with the Spirit held a little prayer group for that particular city. On the first Friday of every month, they took a card table down to the sidewalk and they put a great big open Bible around it and they stood around it with their arms up raised, you know, these black people are obviously in prayer. She said, Saturdays, uh, the weekend's the devil's playground time, so we're going to get ahead of him. So this was Friday. And sometimes the police car would prowl by and they'd wave to him and say, we're praying for you all. <laughs> Great joy. I mean, after all. I should think that would share the heart of any policeman to start having somebody shoot at him, you know. So, <laughs> so this woman helped me with the lectures, and she suggested this. She suggested that each one of us choose one city. One of the big, mostly northern or western cities, that's where the most trouble was, and that we pray for the blood of the Lamb to cover that city, invisibly but really. You know, like the holy water of the stool, only this was bigger and invisible, but real. And we were to pray for our city every day, not just then, every day. Do you remember? It didn't happen. Do you remember? Summer came, the prophecies did not come true. 
it didn't happen. Okay. So now, in a series of lectures about two years ago, there had been a great deal of violence in certain college campuses, like Kent College, you know, and various others that weren't quite as bad as Kent, but where there was violence. So I asked each member of the congregation to take one college and to pray that the love of Christ there would just dismiss the spirit of violence. It's changed. To that extent, it's changed. There has not been the violence. Oh. You see what I'm getting at? The tremendous potential power that's in our hands. Now, here's my other project, and then I will be still. And this is, I'm not going to do this every lecture. This is just this one time. Although the spirit of violence has greatly decreased in colleges, I find, and I have a great many young friends, grandchildren, and so forth in college, that nevertheless, there is still a spirit of evil and of fear in colleges. And I mean seriously. I am not just kidding. In a certain college where one of my grandchildren went, the percentage of suicide was 20% of the entire college. Mm -hmm. now. now, certainly that doesn't come from our Lord Jesus. Where has it got to come from? It's got to come from the enemy. But we don't need to know the enemy. All we need is to know Jesus. We know there is an enemy, that's all. But the only one that we need to look to is Jesus. We waste our time, fritter away our energy, and I think do more harm than good if we try to find out just who is the enemy and who are the agents and how this happens. Oh, no, 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 that's not the way. <laughs> Never mind that. The one you need to know it's Jesus. Now I'm going to suggest to you a tremendous adventure. Now, if you really do this, and if I'm still floating around this world next summer, which I think I will be, I might just pop in and say thank you, thank you, like the Chinese do. Thank you. Thank you. If each one of you would choose one college. Now, don't tell anyone. This has to be a secret move. I don't quite know why, but it works better if it's secret. I just don't know why, but it really does. Choose one college and pray in your secret prayers just with you and Jesus that the active power of the Holy Spirit I don't mean, you know, just excitement and jumping around and speaking with tongues. That's okay. But what I mean is the real transforming inner power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ will touch that college and so impalpably and invisibly set it on fire with the love of Christ that it's going to fall in love with Jesus. That in somehow the whole, the style, you know how you kids are. I mean, it's the style to do this and not to the other at all. And so instead of being the style to crawl in and out of each other's beds and so on and so forth, it'll be the style to meet on a hilltop at sunset and the door of the Lord. You know, I really mean it. I'm not kidding. But for it to happen inwardly from the kids themselves, you know, no rip-snorting, ranting leader coming and saying, that, well, now if the Lord should do it that way, okay, but I think it would be more wonderful and more beautiful, more lasting and more absolutely thrilling if nobody except those of us who pray know how it happened. Don't you think so? Wouldn't that be a simply glorious venture? So that is... My one project that I'm passing on to you, after this I'm willing to listen to you and yours, but this is the one that I'm passing on to you. Not just for this CFO, although do let's begin at this CFO. 
Now I'll begin with the one that I mentioned. Though I didn't tell you the name, but I know which one it is. It's about as tough a one as there is. <laughs> so, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have given to us such wonderful opportunities, such marvelous possibilities of spiritual ventures that we can carry on upon this earth. Oh, Lord, thank you. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you that your life pervades the very earth that we walk upon. So that you said if people didn't praise you, the stones would cry out in your praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your love fills the very air that we breathe. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your love can go not only from one to another of us, and that is good, but can go forth through us, and from us. To the ends of the earth, but especially now, to the coast of California, to the coast of New England, to the coast of Florida, to the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, covering this land on which we live, and transforming those institutions of learning, so that the people who go there will learn of you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, teach us how to pray. Lord Jesus, may we learn of you how to pray, and how to pray for this earth, and how to transform it into the kingdom of our God, and of his Christ. Amen.